The grade cricketer is a Twitter stream. It's about playing crickets at the grade level. Boys! Get a few today, did you? To be honest with you, I um, hate grade cricket. <laughs> uh, I went into to play for a team called... Um, the men of skateboarding. Obviously, sharing's always a big issue, a big issue for, for young kids coming into a senior cricket team. I think it was like a win lead. Um, a bit of advice that I'm trying yeah. to follow up. I refer to the great cricketer here and I'll say, this will do a little bit early. <laughs> Cricket is back. Cricket is back in our lives and England roll out that shit. My God. Unric Norky is on the show. Ish Sodi's on the show. A couple of big boys there. A couple of big hands there. Some, some speed, some graft, some grit, some skeletons. Hashtag I just asked to see, of course. This episode is brought to you by Budgie Smuggler, as they all are. Use the code CHAMP for free custom design at budgiesmuggler.com. Uh, my name's Ian Higgins. Sam Perry sits across from me. Pez, uh, it, it was at least nice to have the cricket back in our lives. I thought we were sent up for a game there. I thought a game was going to happen. A game sort of did happen, but sort of just petered out for 48 hours, the last 48 hours of the game. Uh, England, New Zealand. Um, but I guess, um, you know, at least there was some cricket back in our lives. That's right. That's a grateful attitude. You've taken there, Higos. To my mind, there's only two ways of looking at this match that's just concluded. Only two binary lives that we lead. Mm -hmm. The first is a view that will be advanced by elites, liberal media elite. (laughs) Yeah. Who want to tell you, the punter, how to think. Mm -hmm. They'll say stuff like this, Higos. What do they say? This was a nuanced, intriguing battle between two sides on very different journeys arm wrestling with various amounts of doggedness, skill, and some rust over five rain-affected days, settling for a draw that in the end was as compelling for its intricate subplots as it was for the return of spectators to the game itself. That's the sort of shit you're going to read from some places, from some quarters. Mm. I'm not quoting anyone. That's actually quite good. Thank you. Or... It's quite good. A couple of qualifiers you, yeah, there. Yeah, qualify a little, it. A little, little bit of a caveat. Give yourself a bit of wiggle room. <laughs> well, the second... This match... First test between England and New Zealand at Lords, mm-hmm. it had another gear in it. But because this Lords test match wasn't as important as any others, as future test matches, because of injuries, because of priorities, because of conditions, because of the novel coronavirus, which is possibly a decent reason, mm-hmm. that gear remained unrealized. Yeah. And that unrealized gear is unforgivable. It is forgivable. Um, and despite New Zealand's best efforts for setting up a thrilling finish, dangling a carrot, mm-hmm. inducing the praise of Shane Warne, and if any mob had a reason to go about this like it was a centre wicket, mm. it was them. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, instead of that, instead of potentially thrilling finish, we missed out on a full-blown cojones out battle and he instead ended up watching something closer to a glorified centre wicket where we had to watch Dom Sibley scratch off his hip for 50 not out, and we all end up feeling nothing. It's a tough watch, that is. Tough hey, watch. just Dom Sibley. Yeah. He opens a batting in Test Match Cricket. Good mm. on him. It, it, he can do it however the fuck he likes. And he's played great cricket, so he must be good. Exactly. <laughs> if you get 50 not out at Lords, good for you. Don't care how you do it. But on the other hand, fuck me. On the other hand, cricket's a TV show, and that's kind of the uh, whole spectrum of what, of what I, how I want to consume this this match in itself. Because cricket, like, when you play cricket pairs, let, let, let me explain to you a few things about cricket, right? Please. Cricket, like, when you're playing it, is just like a pastime, it's a hobby, it's a thing you enjoy, you want to get better at it, and it's just like it's fun, 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 until you get to the very top, and then it's a business. Then it's a television product. That's Third all that it is. It's just... It's, <laughs> yeah, I'm talking when the very you, when top. When you get to threes. Yeah, the very top. A couple of guys that come back from ones. Yeah. yeah, mm, yeah he used yeah. to play ones. Yeah, yeah, Well, fuck, mm. he must be good. Uh, Not really. Mm. Why does he get naked? Um, so when you reach the very top, then it's like, then it just changes the whole spectrum of the sport. Now it just becomes an entertaining product. The people are coming out of the coronavirus pandemic of which we live in today. They're using this as an escape. We heard about during the IPL that, you know, the, the conversations are should the game, should the tournament continue? Well, a lot of people were consuming that as a way to escape from the realities of the uh, the harshness of the world that we surround ourselves in at the moment, you know, with the pandemic and whatnot. And then this happens and it's like, what are we doing here, guys? And like, I've said this the last like three weeks and I feel like, and I fucking don't know what England are playing at. What's their game plan? If it's the Ashes, it's fucking dumb. And it's like, it's uh, it's a waste of time. 
Because every single person knows that they ain't winning the Ashes. Everyone knows that. Are they going to win a fucking test? Maybe. But, like, that's the that's the entire, um, you know, uh, parameters of which this game is being consumed in. And that, like, there's just some there's some other stuff down down the line. But this could be a fucking great series. Mm. New Zealand get... When are New Zealand going to get respect? Because if New Zealand beat India in the World Test Championship final, which they might, because I sort of forgot about this, but um, New Zealand fucking smashed India in New Zealand uh, in... 2019 smashed him full strength Indian team was that 2019 yeah yeah um Colin getting out Coley that kind of gear it could happen again could and then if even if New Zealand win then are they, are they gonna get the respect because they should be getting respect right now from England they're like ah we've got some other stuff down the line we've got India coming to five tests we've got the hundred on we've got a world cup we've got the ashes in a year seven months whatever and so I just feel like people at the ground even in this game are like Oh, it's a warm-up game. I'm being let down. I don't like it. By focusing on the Ashes, I like, we've just completely skipped over like what happened in the match. <laughs> all right, I'll tell you. Conway got a double ton. That yeah. was great. Yeah, that on was debut, good. he was player of the match. Good. On mm. a board, all that sort of shit. Yep. Southey, 6-4. Good. Yeah. Burns, uh, did well. Burns kept England in the match. Yep. Uh, Ollie Robinson was probably England's best on the field. Uh, and uh, <laughs> yep. and then Sidley scratched 50 odd. Whatever. Whatever. Uh, it came Williams from set up the match with good captaincy. And yeah. then England said, nah, afraid. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Can we, can we in this day and age of test cricket and the conversations around it, afford the the laxness of the uh, entertainment factor of this, what could otherwise be a huge series, England at home against the second best test team in the world against this wonderful New Zealand side. Can we just be like, ah, some other, some other good stuff will happen. Only three teams play test cricket. Well, here goes, you know, we were discussing this off air. And England are literally uh, one test into a run of, what, seven plus five, 12 tests. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and they've so already played th- And they've six. just played one game and drawn it <laughs> where they've got a lot of players left out. Yeah, and we're like, yeah, sure. knives out. Yeah. Because... Well, you we're can, Australian. We're Australian. And they, you'd expect them to do the same thing. But it's yeah. like, can you... You know, and you keep coming back to this, and rightly so, after the first test in Chennai, was it? In India. So yes. we can go all the way back there where yeah. England adopted the next thing is more important than the current thing right. philosophy. Yeah. And you can just see on the horizon the way this might play out if it doesn't go to plan. Mm-hmm. By focusing on the ashes, and Chris Silverwood said that, whether it was a slip or not, mm. they're giving the impression everything they're doing yeah. is about the next thing, not the current thing. So by focusing on the ashes, they leave the impression that these matches matter less. Yeah. Like, if it was a circuit, India and Australia are upstairs cargo. Right, they're upstairs. For people who are from Sydney in the 2000s. Right. And New Zealand and the rest are downstairs cargo. Mm-hmm. They treated this test match like downstairs cargo. Mm-hmm. Not just for the way they attacked the last day, mm-hmm. but for the entire build-up to it and who they've made available, yeah. etc. Yeah. Yes, mitigating factors, yeah. no doubt, but you can debate them. There's a policy yeah. of treating this like a second-tier game. Now, uh. they've literally just um, drawn this match and they're missing a th- like three first 11 players, but should the knives be out? I say yes. Because mm. we're talking about the Ashes here, guys. Well, Aust- Australia's vulnerable. We've, we've called this out. The batting has gaps. Mm. Payne's getting on. Warner's going to be 35 in the summer. There's no middle order. Stark's no great shakes mm-hmm. last summer. Mm-hmm. He's no sure bet. Um, and whichever way you swing morally, there's clearly problems between the players and Langer. Right. Right? Yeah. They're, they're, they're just, there was reports this week that they've actually been doing reviews and there's issues. Right? Yeah, yeah, there's, yeah, there's, yeah. There's no yeah, doubt yeah. there's issues. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wherever you want to land on who's right or wrong It's all that. good. There's issues. But by God... He goes, mm-hmm. D- just wait until we realise the healing powers in this country of a pasty, disorganised, <laughs> overthinking England squad landing on our shores, yeah. our bright, sunburnt shores. Mm. So powerful are these ties that bind that news court papers will attack them. Yes. We'll put all of our differences aside yep. politically, <laughs> internally within yes. the team. Bipartisanship, truly. For exactly. The yes. They land on our shores. News court papers attack them with glee. Yep. We all laugh joyously, regardless of where you are on the political spectrum. Yep. Like the team and Langer at loggerheads, but but all of a sudden we're going to have angled up pictures of Stark, Cummins, and Hazelwood with moustaches mm. mm. against a glary sunburnt sky mm-hmm. behind them. Tim Payne will refuse to show his eyes in any interview, dealing in speed dealers only. Yes, fuck yeah. McGraw will say we're going to win eight <laughs> nil. <laughs> yeah, and. England will have constructed unification in Australia yes. by the way they're dealing with this now. Yes. 
All they need to do is just win games with their best team mm. and we'll be in trouble. But instead, they're going to fucking concoct this shambles of yeah. a summer. Oh, James Bracey got a game back in uh, back in May. Did he? Um, yeah, mate. Uh, they, they're going to bring us together. The, only, the way they're dealing with this. The only way England win or get uh, if it even being close here is if they come in red hot yeah. into our summer. They beat New Zealand. They dust um, India. India. They have a decent World Cup run mm. as well. That's but that, instead they're worrying about oh what should we do uh, who's going to bat four at the Gabba I mean fuck me mm. like it's just it's a fucking shambles. Uh, England in Australia is um, is just about chest and attitude. Mm. Like bring in Milan, mm-hmm. he scored a hundred here before. Like you're fr- double Milan comes out and bats, you'd be like hmm, he could score runs here was, because he's arrogant enough. I was just, do it, mate. I was just thinking about like so he's, he's got a, a problem, chest. We interviewed him. He's got a chest. Ian Cha- <laughs> <laughs> Ian Chappell wrote an article, uh, might have been today or yesterday, and he was saying like that, that England's pace attack is good, and I, I, I agree. England's mm. pace attack here will be good. No the, fucking no runs. There are no runs. Joe Joe Root is a fine batsman, averages forty nine in Test cricket. He's never scored a hundred in Australia. The only two guys who'll be on that tour who have scored hundreds, Stokes and Bearstow. Is Bearstow even going to play? <laughs> Hope so. <laughs> yeah, 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 same. But um, he's he's got six Test hundreds. One of those in Perth. I think that was when he batted with Milan. It actually might have been. Stokes has also got a it's test. When he head butted his helmet after he scored it. Yeah, I think that was yeah. in Perth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um uh, yeah, Stokes has got a test hundred in Perth as well. Um but it's, but there's just no runs. There are no runs, there's no momentum. They they're worried about a test series happening in seven months' time. They're gonna fuck it up. They're already fucking it up. It doesn't make any sense to me. Hey, Burns batted well, I thought. Hey, really good. Kept him kept him in it. What about New Zealand? Any it, you're gleaning anything from that ahead of the World Test Championship? I don't think any New Zealand player had a bad game, except for maybe Kane. Mm. Uh, I saw some stuff online about there was maybe some questions about a captaincy. might have been a little bit uh, – he could have been more aggressive. I don't, I don't know, maybe. Ross Taylor looks off the pace to me. Yeah, see, we were talking about this last night, weren't we? And we're just, I, I've seen him sort of like look at all at sea before, then he just kind of just still gets some runs. I mean, I guess he was trying to tee off in this fourth innings here. He got 30 off – uh, run a ball ish first innings like as well yeah, yeah, yeah. Goes. feet everywhere so, eyes are gone feet eyes hands mm. love him <laughs> love, love yeah. him yeah yeah you know it pains me to say it mm. I'm in pain apparently he was a gun hockey player I'll bet he yeah. that's what Simon Dewar was saying yeah, commentary yeah. gun hockey player oh, he's been a great player Ross Taylor is anyone at the top level of any sport just good at one sport <laughs> <laughs> fuck they're always good at everything because he just massive got huge hands yeah but New, Ze- well, New Zealand New Zealand and New Zealand they're just they're steady try and watch an Aussie rules player pass <laughs> a rugby union or league ball, though. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Sure, but they probably got soccer or something. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Or cello. I uh, noted that um, Devin Conway, after it, well, he's, he's scored his double ton, but ahead of the game, they are, they're asking him how he might prepare for the World Test Championship final. Yeah. And he said he sprinkled kitty litter in the nets to train for India's oh, spin Oh, yeah, attack. that's right, yeah. Yeah. So I think they've got all bases covered, <laughs> New Zealand. Didn't they strike you as a, as a, a really solid unit, he goes? They, they strike you yeah, as a, a unit team. like... Uh, yeah. Like if anyone could, like I said, anyone could have treated it like a warm up game. It was them, and they kind of did. They they look like a team who's well oiled, well drilled, well balanced. Uh, they they didn't go through the motions in the match, but like they they seemed like a mm. uh, a finely tuned test team playing good cricket with solid operators across the board. They really kept England at arm's length throughout the match. England mm. could sort of scarcely make an impression upon mm. them in terms of getting ahead in the game. Mm-hmm. It was rain affected, but, mm. um, and that's great. I mean, we're just saying off air as well, like I, I, I just couldn't see a scenario where Australia would let New Zealand dictate like no, that in let, a game. No, let that happen. No way. No. Can't uh, see it. It was quite, it was, a, it was quite a, I mean, it's only one game, but it's, it was a, Quite a cuckolding going just this, on, really. There's this air. There's something in the air about this. It's all very just like uh, this doesn't count. It's doesn't all matter. second tier. And that, and Michael Vaughan actually made this point on Twitter last night. There's no there's no Test Championship final points on the line this game. Why not go for it? Like why not? Why not, did did the way simply bat in the fourth innings where he got sixty off eight hundred and fifty balls? Mm-hmm. Did that would that that surprise England? Did, were they kind of hoping he had a bit more momentum so they got a little bit closer then had a look at it? Or was there any intention? Mm. Or is they or they kind of looking at Dan Lawrence, Bracey batting uh, six and seven, Ollie Pope hasn't scored runs in a while. They kind of thinking like, oh, this could actually fuck up. And then we're right behind the eight ball going to edge Baston for the second test, then leading mm. into the India series. Is that is that all part of it? I don't know. But there's no way that this game is just about this game. That's, mm. that's the kind of conversation that I feel that like we're trying to have here. Mm. That this game, usually a test match, 
it, it has its own context all wrapped up in what happens over the course of five days. But they, but this this for me actually starts when England got out of South Africa because um, because of the the, the, the new COVID strain there. They actually the the beta the beta strain they're calling it, um, ironically. And so they got out of there because they wanted to go to India. Then they were one nil up in India, and they're like, "Well, let's change the team because we've got, we've got some other stuff going on. We want to get back here to play against New Zealand. Let's make eighteen changes." Uh, yet they New Zealand set them a target two seventy off seventy five overs. Nah, we don't really fancy that. What the fuck's going on, mate? I think it's the like the question is how do you create momentum? And for them, mm. they believe that momentum is created by um, keeping players fresh. That's fine, keeping yeah. them ready to go for matches that they have defined matters to them Mm -hmm. they look at the fourth innings and look let's be real for a second and not baity about it i mean (laughs) no one scored it more than sort of three and a bit and over in the game tough tough enough wicket to bat on yeah that was even the case for new zealand who were 100 ahead in the third innings and still only went at three and a bit and over Mm -hmm. and and root pointed that out but clearly on some level the the i the risk of an inexperienced side getting out, having another failure would be seen to be more disadvantageous Mm. than um, having go and winning. But the problem is like nothing creates momentum within a side like winning. I mean, because in order to win by definition, someone has to have succeeded. Mm. And that means an awful lot to that person who has succeeded. But if everyone goes in just essentially protecting their spots, getting, Mm. you know, facing balls, having a glorified net because Mm. the next game is more important. Mm. I, I don't know. I just feel like it's a too cute by half approach that may yeah. blow up in their face. You can't, you can't go and try and win the Ashes away by not losing several series in a row beforehand. That That's not the way it kind of goes. And don't you feel like it – because this is all about England's batting, and it has been for ages. They've been a team that struggled to get more than 300 in the first innings for years now. And it feels like with Joe Root especially, the big problem when Joe Root fell out of our top four big boys – the problem is he's got 49 50s and he scored 20 hundreds. His ratios are all fucked up. And you, you can't have your best bats for not scoring match-winning innings, right? So it feels like in England's batting lineup. Now, Rory Burns batted really well, and I think he's going to be a good player for a long time for mm. them. And he may even do well out here. Um, but I just feel like unless Root scores like a, a double hundred, like mm. he has uh, in Sri Lanka and then he did in the first test in India, unless he does that or Stokes does something fucking unbelievable, they just they can't win by scoring runs. There's there's, mm. there's just no one in the team who's going to set up a platform to win in the game by scoring big runs in the first innings. Mm. And so I look at their like their their top order now. Of course, in this game they're missing uh, likely Butler, maybe Bearstow, Stokes. Mm. Okay, Stokes averages thirty seven, uh, Bearstow averages thirty four, and St- and um, and Butler, Butler averages thirty five. Mm. You know, so apart from Root, there's the there's only one person who averages forty. <laughs> so they're the three guys that you would look to though to win on that fourth innings in that game. I mean, the rest of the sure. team are not really aggressors in that, you know, in yeah. that van Dan Lawrence well. can Dan Lawrence can go, but he's just struggled a lot since he's coming to the side. But, yeah. Yeah. It's just funny, you know, fortune favours the Braves. If you have a crack at winning, someone might do something that actually really does shore them up mm. for the Ashes. And yeah, that's going. right. And if you play with that level of belief and freedom, mm. this is me because I'm Trevor Bayless now, you see. That's right. Three's version. <laughs> But if you give him the license to play with that freedom, you never know what might happen, yeah. I suppose. Yeah. The, the, the fear of failure is clearly greater Yeah, the fear of success I just, as I said, after one test that they draw. Well, my, as I said at the top, I just feel this frustration because I just feel like this could be a great series and I feel like we're just kind of mm. getting a bit of like, pfft, yeah, just chuck this on. It was an unrealised gear in that game. Yeah. The only like real test gear I saw was Neil Wagner roaring at Stuart Broad occasionally. <laughs> that was And that was great. Yeah, yeah it barely felt like a test match, right? I mean, maybe, maybe when they go to Urchbaston next week, uh, at the end of this week, then maybe with seventeen thousand people there in the in the crowd, then maybe maybe people will fire up. Well, you know, I just go back to a meta bat and the amount, the howls of derision from oh. England about how this wasn't cricket, how that cricket <laughs> wicket was not cricket. Yeah. And then I looked at this fucking yeah. shower, yeah. and I was like, yeah. "What the fuck's this?" <laughs> Literally watching a net at Dremoyne. Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I quite enjoy the lilting rhythms and the uh, subtle arm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, Pez, um, England's best player in this game, Ollie Robinson. He took four wickets. He should have had a bag in the first innings. He bowled really well in the in the third innings of the game as well. Um, but uh, he's now suspended for a game because of things that he wrote on the internet uh, almost ten years ago. Yeah, that's right. He looked he looked decent. Big. Big guy yeah, yeah, yeah. hits the wicket hard. Oh well, I, I, I scored some runs. Scored some runs as well. Yeah, well, he, and he came in after England lost three for none, so helped steady as well. And uh, yeah, like, like uh, when I talk about Ollie Robinson, like England have a, a um, proclivity for bringing through players and talking them up a fair bit. You yeah, know, I've said that before. Like yeah, that Toby Rowland Jones kind of thing. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, hey, good good player, etc. But like yeah. Robinson actually looks. 
it looks a bit test cricket to me. Like it's mainly the size and that's the language that we speak. But yeah, like big mm. hits the wicket hard. You know, I'm mm. bobbing my head as I talk yeah, about yeah. him. I'm jutting my bottom lip out. Fuck you yeah. know, Ollie Robinson. He's yeah. he's looking good. Played a bit yeah. of great cricket out here as well. Obviously, yeah, yeah. Um, Must he, be good. Interesting contrast to Broad and Anderson. Like just bowled a bit more penetration than them as well. So I thought that he looked good. I noted, uh, and then just with the the Twitter stuff, the Twitter stuff. Mm-hmm. A friend of the show, Ali Martin. Um, among other things, said, you know, his debut having been overshadowed by his use of Twitter as a teenager is one way of conceiving what he did uh, and is full of nuance. Like, I actually don't mind the decisive action of the ECB just to rub him out, uh, and it's probably just going to be one game. Yeah. Um, like, it's a suspension. He cops it on the chin, and at least from a player's standpoint, you're left in no uncertain terms as to, like, the ECB's view. Uh, if there's evidence you've been racist or sexist, especially publicly. It's just yeah. a suspension. He'll be yeah. back. Yep. He just takes it, yep. you know, and it's like, no, nah, just no tolerance, bang, you're gone, you're out. Mm. Um, heaps of complexity around him doing it, people digging up tweets and all that sort of shit. But, like, as a as an action, mm. if you sort of – I just think if you uh, if you get too cute by half with it, you give him a fine or something, players sort of go, oh, okay, well, you know, it's mm. it, are, are they coming down hard on this or not? I mean, mm. you just got you just got to cop it. Mm. Yeah, I think that's – I think that's bang on. I actually hadn't seen the tweets until literally just before we mm. came in before. Um, and reading them, they're like, oh, this is fucking like bottom 1% dumb shit. Like it's fucking so mm. dumb. Mm. Um, yeah, you don't want to like class racism in different ways, but it's you definitely – that's why Ali's saying, you know, Twitter as a teenager is important. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. It's very it, – it reads like a teen would write. Yeah, yeah, barely. yeah. I guess – um. I think you're. I think you're exactly right with that. Just fucking take the ban, rub it out. That's the ECB's policy with it. Good call. Takes mm. the ban, move on from it. I guess I'm more interested in like the nuance of it. You know, like because it happened so long ago in his life, and especially those developmental years. And mm. now he's in the public public spotlight, and he's got mm. a profile now and stuff. Maybe that doesn't change it at all, but I guess it's a factor in some capacity. Um, oh, it definitely. Just, it's, just, it's just that, like, I just I would imagine that he's just such a different person now, and mm. and um, I actually haven't even. You were saying before you saw his apology. And he seems extremely remorseful, and that's all. Those are all good things. Doesn't change that maybe he should take some punishment for it, which I guess is um, is is what's happening anyway. But you know, I, I suppose we actually spoke about this. We're doing that. We're obviously doing our YouTube daily shows after each day's play, and we're kind of talking about it then. And like both things can be true that um, you can have a bit of sympathy for him that he, this probably was a different part of his life. And he's obviously very ashamed of it, embarrassed by it. And also at the same time, acknowledge that um, the things that he literally did say and there's evidence of the things that he said are really bad and need to be punished. So, you know, but I think probably both things can be true in that capacity. T- totally. And you think about the people who are on the receiving end of those kind of ideas as well. It's all good to like, a, you know, pontificate, you know, from an Australian studio about like, uh, yeah, oh, yeah, 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 mate, you know, yeah, well, yeah. he's changed and all that kind of stuff. But mm. I, I reckon both things are true. It's just like he probably does look back and people go, well, that's from a long time ago and he has changed, but also just decisive action, yeah, racist, yeah. sexist, for, forget wading into the complexity of it, yeah. rub him out for a game, he'll be back. Yeah. Good player, he, you know, we move on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this mm. is probably the learning thing for for everyone, including himself. So um, uh, I guess I guess in that, capa- in that capacity, he probably uh, commend the ECB for making that really – Swift decision. Well, I, I know that Andy Bull wrote on the you know piece overnight as well that like the ECB are trying to do a lot to make cricket more inclusive in the country as well. You mm. know, it's a game that definitely does seem to align with some you know middle upper class people oh, who yeah, tend to sure. seem yeah, to yeah. look the same way. Um, <laughs> and so you got the hundred coming out. You 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 want to create a game that is more accessible to more people. So you know you would be really pissed off for that stuff to come up now and go. Yeah, oh no, an England yeah. Test play, even though it was a long time ago, is yeah, saying yeah. shit like that. Yeah. There's other st- other tweets that have come out as well from people, some more senior players that are like d- yeah. don't seem you know as directly malicious, but you know a, a lot of guys have form, and I, I don't yeah. mind the um, the administration coming out and going, nah, pack them, just pack them for a couple of games. Yeah, you know, yeah. you're suspended. See ya. You know, you know what I, was thinking? I was thinking about before because um, you know Kawaja, um, there was an article in ESPN, um, Quick Info about Kawaja. He's doing some stuff with um, you know. It, making cricket more diverse mm. in Australia. I'm just kind of thinking about like, well, what, what would he think if he was listening? I don't, I don't even know mm. if he does listen to this. He might do. But if he was thinking like, you know, not that I am defending Ollie Robinson, mm. but just kind of just pontificating about the punishment that he was getting. I wonder like if, if anyone of any um, ethnic minority was was listening to this being like, Pfft, cool, your jet set boys. Now just fucking take the band. Shut I bet it up. happens all the time, to be honest. Well, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm yeah. sure. Budgie smuggler. <laughs> <laughs> Now some capitalism. <laughs> um, hey, can I just quickly talk about Budgie Smuggler before we go to the uh, 
the interview? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, great man's a budget smugglers do anything what they're doing. Um, Jesus. They're giving you free design on custom smugglers, he mm. goes. And uh, I, d- I was thinking about what, what, what do you want to put on your smugglers this week? Well, I was actually working on the term smugglers. Okay. I'm thinking who are the greatest drug smugglers of all time? So I looked that up. drug smugglers? Yeah. Okay. I'm not glorifying it. Yeah, okay. Pablo Escobar. Yeah. Some other guy called Freeway Rick Ross. <laughs> and there was another famous drug smuggler called Christopher Coke. Hey, Robert, what did they do? What was his bag? <laughs> but I thought maybe that's too far. Chappelle Corby for mine. You know the lawyer who um, represented um, Chappelle Corby? And then do you remember the whole thing? Um, I remember it, yeah. Went, no, yeah, <laughs> but this specific bit where there was an accusation laid towards uh, Qantas, baggage, Qantas baggage handlers that they had some hand in um, putting like, what was it? It was like four kilos or some shit of marijuana in her... Um, yeah, um, boogie bag. Boogie bag, yeah. Boogie board boogie, bag. Boogie board boogie, bag. Boogie board. Oh, that's a fun thing to say. Boogie board bag. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so like he, he, put, he, put, he placed that idea forward and he was um, disbarred for that because there was absolutely zero foundation for it. Mm. Oh, so sounds people about need, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah so, so don't do that if you're thinking you about doing that. You can't just say shit. You can't just say shit, mm. yeah, especially Since, as a lawyer. Yeah, yeah you can't cool. just say shit. It's rich of us to say. Yeah. Uh, or, or you could look at, you know, if, if drug smugglers is too... Too far a push, and it may maybe. You look at burglars, some of the great burglars of all time. Hand Bush burglar. Cassidy, the Ham Burglar, Bonnie and Clyde. Yeah, any slow, medium pace bowler at any level. <laughs> <laughs> Colin, lamest thing. Ha yeah. ha ha. Yeah, yeah. that's budgies. You can get that. At <laughs> <laughs> I usually go champ. For free custom design for any of those things. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> Jesus. Christ. That England just tried hard in that game. <laughs> If only they went for it, we'd be talking about so many, so many different things. Budgiesmuggler.com. A ride in 10 tests for South Africa has already taken three fifers uh, with the best of six for 56. Uh, and we wanted to talk to this guy because we don't feel like a lot of Australians know him yet. Um, but they should and they will. And they will oh, they particularly will. because he goes and I uh, have a bit of a crush on him, actually. Um, well. Cricketing wise, cricketing wise, um, he joins us from St Lucia, where the Proteas are taking on the Windies. Uh, Unri Nokia, welcome to the Great Cricketer. How's it, man? Thanks for having me. It's really nice to be here. Nice to have you, mate. You bowl wheels, and I just wanted to say that from the top. Yeah, um, it's quick. <laughs> Unri, uh, you, you, I'll tell you things you already know. You won four CSA awards, Cricket South Africa awards, uh, last Monday, including the prestigious South Africa. Cricketer of the Year Award. And you said it was despite an up and down season. So I guess my question is, how good can you be if you have a really good season? Yeah, I mean, um, yes, it's just about, I think at the end of the day, winning the game. So um, it's difficult really saying you've had a good season when the team isn't really doing too well. So there's always room for improvement, obviously. So uh, from my side, hopefully just try and improve wherever I can. We've had some moments with the coaches and and with a captain where just identify certain moments um, that could have been better. And, uh, yeah, hopefully this season sort of be on top of those moments and, and hopefully break it through for the team as well. Well, if I could just pick you up on that idea, Unric, that uh, mm. if your team doesn't win, you can't really be that satisfied with the season. I mean, all cricketers know we played at the grade level, mm. uh, just the level below state cricket. We all know that you can have a great game, especially if your teammates lose. It feels great it's to head into better. the change room. You yeah. feel smug. And I just noticed that you actually, you, 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 when remarking on your season, which included a 5 for 56 against Pakistan in Royal Pindi, you called it special, despite the Proteus suffering a 95 run loss. So yeah. on some level, yeah. you must understand that you can have individual <laughs> success, even if your teammates are struggling. Yeah, that's true. But I mean, at the end of the day, you want to win. So. Um, okay. Yes, at, in that moment, maybe um, maybe there's a there's a good feeling about it. But when you look back at it, you still want to win. And um, I'd rather take a one for than than take a five for and and win the game. So yeah, um, yeah. yeah but yeah, it, there's been certain moments that stood out this season, and um, doing it in Pakistan was was one of them. Anrik, I want to talk about fear because you must be scaring people in the nets your entire life. Mm. And I was listening to a story you were telling. Uh, recently, uh, in 2010, when back in the day, the Champions League was in South Africa. And so that's 11 years ago. You must have been, what, you must have been 16, something like that, 16, 17. And you're bowling to some of the guys. And, that's, and the, I believe you bowled to uh, Chennai. 
Um, I mean, yes. who who are you bowling to? Who are you scaring? Did anyone say, I don't want to face this kid over here? No, no one. <laughs> no one at all. I can promise you that. So <laughs> I wasn't that quick. Uh, I was always sort of the, the fast bowler in the team, but um, that was sort of age groups and wasn't that quick. Um, I remember, who was it? Um, Lefty from Oz playing for Chennai. Um, Manners. Yes, I got it. He might have no, I don't think it was him. Um, but Bol- yeah, Bollinger. I just rem- Doug Bollinger. Might have been him, yeah. Mm, yeah. Uh, I just remember like I'm running in, he's like of a five step run up, hitting the post, and <laughs> he can just hear the sound and the energy on the ball, and I'm trying to run in. So um yeah, there was a lot of build up, but it was nice having that opportunity, like seeing everyone. I remember going to MS in, in, in the next day. Um didn't look like he wanted to be there. Didn't look like he came back, to be honest. And then, um, but I don't think I realized, I didn't realize it was him. Um, it, it just looked like, yeah, he was just hitting a couple of balls, standing, almost standing still, not using any feet as he does. And um, yeah, it was just afterwards, it was just such a nice moment to sort of see everyone and, and realize who there is and who, yeah, who the greats are there. Yeah, I thought you, I thought MS might have been there. So you're just bowling to MS Donny, not moving his feet. He's probably doing some helicopter shit. Like, mm. is he? <laughs> <laughs> I actually think they were just blocking it at that stage. When I went out the net, there were some shots fired. So uh, they were just trying to get the eye in at the start, I think. Yeah. Good night, ask. So, so you're bowling to CSK. You obviously, you didn't know who you were bowling to. Mm. And your thought was like, man, this bloke just doesn't move his feet. Is he? <laughs> does he even want to be here? And did you, did you register that thought with them? <laughs> Yeah, I'm not gonna lie, I don't think that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, and then, eight years later, I was hearing the story again. Eight years later, you're bowling in the nets to the South African team, and apparently, you're just peppering Hashim Amla in the nets, hitting him in the ribs, just in the shoulder, just peppering him. And then Hashim's like, "Who is this guy?" Then a year later, you make your debut for South Africa. Is that right? Yeah, I had I had a net session. Um, I think it was actually a nice initiative, sort of getting getting the local guys in the nets. Mm. Um, generally it's just some club cricketers where yeah you know, they had some some of the, the franchise guys in the nets and that was really nice um, and yeah I just I was so nervous I, I didn't think I could pitch a ball up so I was just bowling like back <laughs> on back of the length and um, yeah on, on those wickets as well they're quite fresh in the nets uh, it's not the same as St George's on the on the on the wicket so um, yeah, just try and run in, just run in and bowl fast. And um, there was a few new guys. Our assistant coach was our ex coach at uh, at the Warriors at our franchise, so he got me in. And yeah, I just tried to bowl quick. And um, yeah, some apparently someone was speaking about it, but um, yeah, luckily not too long after that, I got an opportunity. Mm, I love this idea that um, when you're nervous, you can't bowl full, so you have to bump people. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just too nervous. Yeah, sorry, oh, well, mate. Sorry, sorry, Hush. Really... <laughs> it's funny, we were talking to Mornay Morkel the other day, and he was saying, you know, his introduction to the South Africa team was similar in the sense that he just bowled really well in the nets to Jack Callis. Oh, yeah, yeah. And uh, Callis is like, oh, he can play. Yeah. So it sounds to me like one of the best pathways into the South African team is just to have nets. a great net. Uh, I reckon it was it more. We don't do it too often then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I mean, let's get it out of the way. Uh, Rick, you've talked about this before. I mean, can you, you – you've, you've – You've registered, you know, 156 on the clock in the IPL and stuff like that. You know, can you can you break 160? I mean, you know that we're the only language we speak in Australia is of fear and violence and intimidation and pace. So, talk to us in our language. Can you can you go that fast? I'd like to. Uh, definitely, when I'm training, when I'm when I'm off the off the field, it's a it's a goal. Um, when I'm on the field, it's just about performance and and getting wickets and. Yeah, helping the team win. But um, when I'm off the field, it is definitely something that motivates me. That that sort of when you're tired or when you don't want to do the extra sets or whatever it is, just to try and push on. So it's definitely something um, I'd like to do. I'd like to achieve. But uh, for now, I think yeah, it's been a long season. Um, it will be difficult to do it now, but hopefully in the future, um, I do think that's something I'd like to do. Because as Pez just said, you bowled 156 in the IPL, fastest ball ever bowled in the IPL. Of your 10 tests, four you've played in Pakistan or India. You're now in the West Indies. You must be like, can I just let loose in South Africa against the Aussies? Like, you, mm. must, have been, you must have been so disappointed that Australia decided not to, not to travel over for that, that test series back in March. 
Yeah, it would be nice to play against them. It's it's always nice uh, to play in in SA as well. Um, I think we would have played up country, so um, I'm I'm from the coast, so there's there's not a lot of bounce, not a lot of play. So it's always nice playing up country. Mm. Um, but yeah, I think all in all, playing the Australians, we had that one day series just before COVID, and that was really nice. Um, sort of, there's always some sort of just extra adrenaline going when it's the Aussies. It was my first time, didn't know about anything, but it, there's just something extra. So um, it is really nice playing against them and um, hopefully we can play that soon. Um, really excited to to go head to head against some of the boys. And, and did you, am I right in thinking that you played indoor cricket as a kid? Yes, I did, yeah. Were, yeah, were, from, you, uh, were you scaring people eight, again uh, with, that, like, with that yellow ball? Because that thing hoops. Yeah, no, listen, cross him, mate. <laughs> <laughs> no control. <laughs> yeah, no, cross him, I think. Probably under 18, I started going see him, uh, okay, um, okay. especially with that yellow ball. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Anrik, uh, just recently Dean Elgar said that, uh, that the team needs to get back to the Protea way, which mm. when he was pressed on it, he said means more hundreds and fifers. Mm. Uh, so when you go out and play, you just under bags of pressure to, to take a bag or a fifer? Mm. Uh, yeah, I won't say there's pressure. Uh, we've got we've got a great um, we've got a great lineup with Keiji, Lungi, Keshav, uh, Shamsi. Uh, we've we've got a lot of skill and a lot of talent. Um, guys with a lot of experience, even if it might not be international, they've played a lot of domestic cricket. So uh, hopefully. Hopefully, uh, we can get like a lot more fifers from a lot of different individuals. But uh, I wouldn't say there's a lot of pressure on myself. I'm just trying to do my best for the team. Whether it's whether it's budding partnerships, I think that's something we've we've been big on in the in the past in the last like season and a half maybe. Uh, budding in partnerships. I remember against England, myself and Dwayne Pretorius, we had a good partnership there. Um, he was just building pressure on the one side, and I got some wickets on the other side. So. Um, even if we can do that, uh, I'd, be, I'd be more than happy to do that. But um, yeah, hopefully, if there's a fire for two, I'm not going to say no for that. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed, uh, Anrik, that uh, that the South African team all got the Johnson and Johnson, the one jab vaccine. Do you guys got? Then I understand as well that that you're allowed to train in the West Indies where you are now after you get two negative COVID tests. So I mean, what I'm asking is, has have Johnson Johnson called you to make sure that you guys pass those tests? Because that's fairly important to, uh, to to prove the efficacy of that vaccine. Yeah, uh, only cricket for now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah like. <laughs> only cricket, yeah, no, well, no, no, all good. Anrik, uh, I want to talk about the IPL a little bit. You mm. spent some time with the Delhi Capitals last year. It tends you, you can't talk about the Delhi Capitals without everybody on their knees worshipping Ricky Ponting, which we do as well daily uh, when we come into the studio. Yeah. Uh, what, what was the experience of working under uh, Punter? Because all players just say that he just is an unbelievable coach. He is. He's, he's very good. Um, especially last year when I got to work, obviously playing a little bit as well. Um, just experiencing a little bit more. Um, he's really good in, in sort of assessing, understanding, um, and how he sort of breaks things down. So, I really enjoyed that. Uh, he's sort of straight, if I can call it that. He's straightforward, tells you what's going on, but also the way he just breaks it down. It, there's no, not a lot of cliches, which I really enjoyed. Uh, it's it's whether there's maybe the opposition maybe ran a couple of extra twos more than you did. Uh, maybe they scored a couple of boundaries more than you did or they bowled more dot balls. So he's quite good at that. Um, and yeah, it, it just feels like there's a good understanding of the game of what we did well or what we did wrong. And then we just try and improve on that every time. And that was really nice to see and, and experience. Mm. And just, uh, you know, the, the BCCI have announced when the second phase of the IPO will take place against UAE because it's monsoon season in India, that's why. <laughs> but um, <laughs> it's just got to avoid the monsoons. A lot of, a lot of the, uh, players from different countries have got scheduling issues then off the back of different quarantines and whatnot, you're probably going to see teams with different makeups to what they had in the first half, the IPL. You were with Delhi. What's your status with the IPL? Are you able to say? Uh, do you, would you expect to be back with the uh, with the Capitals? I've got absolutely no idea, to be honest. Um, we haven't spoken about that as a as, uh, South African team, but um, we scheduled to... I'm not sure if we scheduled, but uh, there were talks of maybe playing India before that. 
before the World Cup. So obviously playing India, that won't happen. Then I'm not too sure whether that will or not. But um, if the IPL does happen, I'm not sure whether we will be available or not. Um, like I said, we've got really no idea at this, stage, at this stage what's going on. Mm. Just the last one for me, Enric. I mean, um, it, it's an interesting time in South African cricket, isn't it? Because, I mean, I think South Africa have only played eight tests in the last two years. I think lost five since Mark Boucher came in. Um, and you're playing against the West Indies away, or well, West Indies at home, who are, who are obviously a very strong team at home. Do you feel a lot of pressure you know, for South African cricket with all the all the, the sort of turmoil, turmoil that's been going on with SA cricket? You know, you're seventh in the test rankings. Is, is there a lot of pressure in the group to actually win both of these test matches? Yeah, I'd probably be lying to say no. Um, we've sort of been saying we're a young team, and we are. Mm. Um, we don't have a lot of experience, and um, we're trying to build. And we sort of telling ourselves it's a process and we want to build and we are going to build on whatever we do have. And like the guys are, are getting better each day, but yes, there is pressure. We want to win. Mm. Um, we feel like we need to win. I feel like I'm uh, only saying, speaking for myself, but mm. I feel like we need to win. Um, we are, we're a good country in general and um, we've got a lot of talent coming up and in general um, we are good test nation so uh, i think we just want to we just want to sort of break that barrier and start winning a couple of games again um it's been difficult like you say we've played eight games i don't know in how long um if you go two games yeah two games there we're not like uh, maybe australia india or yeah. england where you play maybe a five match series i think the last time we played four games was against england and then we had a break again so then it was covered as well so it is difficult, um, especially with the, with the red ball cricket. We, we sort of get together and then we go again. Then it's white ball time and then there's a break again. So mm. we really want to play more cricket, more together as a team. But also we want to win. Um, and 100%, like Dean said, we need to get back to winning ways. So mm. um, hopefully this is the start of something. I'm not sure when the next test series is even. I think maybe even only uh, Boxing Day, maybe. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a long time, but hopefully these two games are quite important for us, so mm. hopefully we can, we can pull through. Mm. Well, Unric Nokia, such a great name to say. Uh, <laughs> such a shame that we couldn't see Australia over there mm. in South Africa uh, facing you. I feel like that would have been very interesting and it would have had its own edge uh, to it. We just have a feeling. <laughs> nothing would have happened. Yeah, no, nothing would have happened <laughs> It at never all. does when we go there. Exactly. Uh, I hope they can reschedule that. I don't get the impression out of Australia that keen, um, yeah. probably because you're bowling 160. But um, <laughs> if not, if not, mate, you know you got a five for against Sri Lanka, against England, against India. You've knocked over Kohli. Uh, you guys are scheduled to come out here, not this summer, but next. I uh, would love to see you, um, you know, rip and tear basically. So uh, and and until then, mate, go well with your cricket, and thanks for joining us. No, thanks so much, guys. Thanks for having me. Really looking forward to coming over to you guys. Uh, yeah, it would be an unbelievable experience. But yeah, thank you so much for having me and have a great day. Okay, he's played for New Zealand 107 times across all three formats. He's bagged 157 wickets to complement 264 wickets in first-class cricket. He's got 350s at test level two to go with nearly 2,500 first-class runs so he can wield the blade mm. as well. Uh, he's from the Brotherhood, uh, so at 28, he's just a baby in leg-spinning terms. Mm. He's also a TEDx speaker, an aspiring rapper, a chess player, and now a guest on The Great Cricketer. One of those things is unlike the others. Ish Sodi, <laughs> welcome to The Great Cricketer. Yeah, cheers, guys. Thanks for having me. Uh, I just, I just want to kick off with off a little bit of a long run here, uh, Ish. You, you only start if I can call you Ish as well. I've just gone real short, but uh, <laughs> I, you, you said you only started playing cricket at twelve. You turned professional at nineteen, playing Test matches at twenty. Your cricket origin story is interesting. Um, it's amazing how many pros have something similar to this. So, as far as I can gather, you bowled medium pace until you were twelve years old, and then Deepak Patel came to a training session when you were twelve. Asked who bowled spin, you lied and said, yeah, I bowl spin. He bowled a leggy and it spun and eight years later made a test debut what bowling spin. So, like, notwithstanding the incredible work you must put into your craft-ish, uh, uh, like, should clubbies around the world feel depressed that this is actually how things actually work? Or should we feel freed because it confirms that guys either just got it or they don't? Oh, well, firstly, I think um, you've obviously done your research, so commend you on that. Um, <laughs> mate, I've seen I've seen so many phenomenal clubbies come into cricket, you know, play their entire careers, and then at 37, 38 years old, decide to bowl spin. And um, you know, by that stage, they would love it. You know, the odd pint, probably in some terrible nick. Yeah. But have an amazing rubber wrist that they probably never used for 
20 years. So, yeah, I really hope, you know, if, if that can free a couple of clubbies out to, to bring those leagues out a little bit earlier, then, then so be it. Like how, how, did the, how did the first one come out out of the hands? Like, that, that's, that's what this comes down to. Like, if, mm. you, if you bowled, like, a triple bounce and it's like, oh, I'll just stick to the meds, just, mm. I'll stick to the stump to stump. The first one must have been, like, mm. gadding ball-esque. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, it came out, like, <laughs> you know, ripped out of my fingers and made this nice little flick sound. Um, oh, yeah. You know, the batsman in the other net was like, oh, man, I heard it fizzing going down there. Um, yeah. Like, <laughs> nah, um, I just let the ball go. And honestly, naturally, I just... If, if I thought about spin bowling and just end up being a leggy and yeah, it did turn sideways if I may so so myself. <laughs> As a, like a connoisseur of leg spin, you know, and you're, you're a, like a big guy, big hands, like, nice and you just hands, talked yeah. about the sound of the, um, the ball out of your fingers. Do you often just bowl to yourself just to listen to that sound? You know, when you snap the ball out of your fingers at home? Mm. Oh, often. I mean, I'm, I'm always, I've always got a ball in my hand. Um, you know, funny, I don't have one at the moment. I've actually got a pen in my hand to take some notes to improve my own podcasting because I'm, I'm learning from you guys. Um, but yeah, I love that sound, that kind of that, you know, oh, like it's yes, quite yes, 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 Oh, yes, mate. Yes. Like as, as a leg spinner, like, you know, growing up loving Warney and like yeah. watching him fizz the ball, man, every time you fizz it in your hands, you just, you know, go back to those memories of being a young fella. But yeah, that sound. I reckon it's similar to a. Yeah. What do you reckon? Oh, yeah, yeah. It's like a real rev head thing. Yeah. Yeah. This is three blokes on a podcast now, just going. Yeah. This is how you podcast. <laughs> just making sounds into microphones. Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. How did you um? How did you go as a junior when you're just sort of building your craft with leg spin? You know, sort of 12, 13, 14, up until basically you turned pro. Um, like dealing with captains who are like probably didn't get spin. You know, pe- you. Pez, Pez bowled leg spin probably, yeah. pr- some would say better than you wish. Couple, but, um, couple of, yeah. <laughs> Meeting oh, with the I'm minds. Sure he does. <laughs> of those, mate. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah, exactly, yeah. But like, how, how did you go with like, dealing with captains who like wouldn't set the right fields or you probably didn't get enough of a go because you, you, obviously when you're building your craft, you're going to bowl the odd half track or whatever and it might be safer as a captain if you're 15 to be like, no, nah, I'm just going to bowl the, I'm just going to bowl my, my fourth change med here, you know? Yeah, I think not not just in juniors. I think that's a kind of, um, I guess, challenge that a lot of leg spinners face in mm. all formats of cricket, all kind of levels of cricket as well. So I think, you know, genuinely comes down to performance. If you get one or two performances in front of the captain, they go a long way to you winning the game. I think that develops that confidence. And mm. and once you've got that confidence from the, the captain, then you can often recreate those, those performances a lot more regularly. So... Yeah, it's a hard one, eh? Because leg, like, leggies can go so badly yeah. wrong. Um, and, you know, being a leggy, I'm always in the leggies corner. Um, but I can understand at times that, you know, captains want to play reasonably conservative um, games of cricket. You know, it's sometimes nice to have a left arm orthodox that just, you know, dots the ball up for, yeah. for a long period of time and you create pressure and that kind of thing. But once you do get a couple of performances, a captain sees it, coaches see it. Um, and they start backing you as their as their wicket taker because that's generally what leg spinners are, and and then you're away. Um, yeah, but it does it does often take that kind of first little hurdle to have that great self belief to be like, yeah, I'm gonna gonna bowl leg spin, I'm gonna do it well, um, and that, those couple of performances give you confidence. Mm, yeah. People on the outside of the spin brotherhood understand that a lot of spinners are just mad in the head, and I feel like it's an occupational hazard or an almost an occupational need to literally mentally work out how you can be someone who has to bowl slow in part sideways on the ball, but be accurate enough to earn the trust of your captain. Mm. Uh, h- how would you kind of conceptualize your own cricketing mentality, trying to work out the absolute roller coaster that is being a leg spinning artist and fitting into an otherwise really conservative game? Mm. Well, you know, on all accounts, I, I consider I do consider spin bowling an art, um, and, and like you say, uh, you know, being a connoisseur of, of spin bowling, I think a lot of a lot of leg spinners do share that passion for the art, um, and a lot of artists that you hear about, you know, you read stories of, of great artists and great musicians, they're all all a little bit mad, um, but leg spinners create some weirdos, man. I mean, like I've, I've met a lot of cricketers over my time, and there's some there's some pretty interesting roosters that bowl leg spinning. You know, I have quite a few mates probably listening to this podcast hearing me say that, and they'll be like, well, it's a bit rich. Um, <laughs> so, you, know, not, you know, at times I probably have to agree. But I think I think in terms of my my passion for leg spin, um, it's probably fair to say that it's a bit of an addiction. Like I genuinely am addicted to leg spin. I, th- I think more so than I am cricket. I just love 
Leaksman. I think probably from being young and watching Warney bowl, you know, then learning um, other Leaksman bowls like, you know, Magilla, who became a good mate of mine for a period there. Um, and then Anu Kumble as well, who was a similar, similar, I guess, height to me and, and bowled with a high arm action as well. But I just find it so addictive, um, the way that it can be done so differently. And I guess it's probably just that, that sound yeah. that I go back to oh, the yeah. ends. I reckon that kind of gives you that little bit of a, I don't know, a bit of a bit of a kick. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. And th- you've also reached the heights of the IPL. Obviously, the the the, st- the strongest you know domestic T Twenty competition in the world, no doubt. And you've got some of the great batsmen, that, including you know New Zealand's very own Kane Williamson. I know you you put, you, you played against him, Rajasthan starting in Sunrises. You got him out, but like, which 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 dialect did you sledge him in? <laughs> well, well, I, luckily I've got three options yeah. there. Um, you know, I've got I, I speak Punjabi pretty well. Yeah. Um, I speak obviously English and um, and silence. I, I chose silence because he was my captain for a long time um, <laughs> and is my captain currently. So yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah I use silence. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, It's always it's a powerful yeah. one as well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I got him out at the end of the day, but we lost the game. But yeah. it's really good to get a guy like Kane out, man. He's he plays spin bowling so well. It sometimes you know feels like when you're bowling the ball, he's got a pillow in his hand and. And you're imparting zero rigs on the ball, so it's nice to get a wicket like that. Yeah, yeah. Can, I, can I ask you about Kane? Because we're trying to figure out this New Zealand team where, like, they just play, you know, quintessentially very um, what correct cricket. You know, in, in in contrast to the Australian way, which is we don't really care if we win or lose. If we win the sledging wall, then that's a that's a mm. that's a W for for us, mm. you know. Um, but then Kane yeah. leads this team very much in his own image. It appears, but like. like I feel like we don't really know much about Kane Williamson. You know, he keeps a very he keeps his cards very close to his chest, hides it all behind the beard, plays very nice cricket, lets the bat do the talking. But as a leader, is he the kind of guy who you know gets you up for a big battle, or is he just kind of just lead by example? Yeah, I think it's really fair to say he leads by example, and mm. and what you see is what you get. I guess he is, you know, comes across as quite calm and and um and composed, and I guess that's the way that he leads as well. I mean, we're lucky to have. A variety of different leaders. You know, you got guys like Tim Southey who will come in and be vice captain, or mm. or be T Twenty leader. And like, I I think he's a phenomenal leader in his own right. But he's more the guy that will you know get in there and you know grab you by the shoulder and be like, come on, let's go and do this, and you know get you up for a game. Um, and then you've got Kane on the other hand, who's like nice and calm and composed. So if you are feeling a little bit too overawed, it creates that nice balance. So. You know, Kane overall is the captain and a great leader, but I think he, that that kind of leadership style that he's got complements all the other yeah. guys. Like, I mean, you got BJ Watling there as well, who, um, you know, may obviously in the test side recently, but um, he's more so sort of leads from a, I guess, example point of view that he, when times get really tough, he stands up and, and mm. does a hard job. So I guess that's leadership in itself again. So mm. various amount of leaders, I think, having a calm and composed um, leader as captain, I think, has mm. made a big. Um, impact on on the team over the last few years. We, we've spent the I think where Higgins is getting at here is that we've spent the last two or three years trying to work out New Zealand and what New Zealand's go is because yeah. everyone seems like a really lovely person, yeah. and it's hard as an Aussie to yeah. trust that really yeah. but, yeah, as, as a cricketer. <laughs> I trust it, um, and probably I know this is more about us, but I suppose given New Zealand's uh, you know poised to be in the World Test Championship final, I mean, how satisfying is it? Uh, as a Kiwi, that Australians are all at sea, given that you're ahead of us in every single sport, you're ahead of us politically, um, and, and and we still can't trust who you are as people. <laughs> oh, well, I mean, <laughs> well, I, I can't really comment too much on that generalisation, man. That's a, a bit of a trap theory. Um, but like, I, I think um, the fact that we've we've been able to rise above you know, a lot of phenomenal cricket teams of this era and get up to that final for that World Test Championship is great. Um, I think if I relate it back to the Aussie, um, I guess, comments that you made, like we, we went over to Australia, I think might have been end of last year. Um, yeah. Or might have been the year before that and really struggled. Um, I, th- I think it's a huge test. Going to Australia and beating Australia in, in um, test cricket, I think is probably the, the ultimate for majority of, of cricket teams you know, definitely in the last two or three decades, um, it's always been a huge challenge. So I think the World Test Championship is great if we can go there and win it. I think it's phenomenal. But, um, you know, I think it'll be great one day if we can get across to Australia and, and compete and compete well and even come away with a series win there in Test career. I think that's that's what will set, I guess, this era aside from, from other great areas of New Zealand cricket. 
um, even though, you know, in terms of win percentage, we've been the most successful, I guess, era for New Zealand mm. cricket. So it's something to be really proud of me. I mean, I, I used to watch cricket when I was young and, you know, winning a game of cricket here or there was awesome. And, you know, if New Zealand did that, it was great. But at the moment, we're winning so many games yeah. and we're competing against the best players in the world. So it's really, really great from a, you know, not just a playing perspective, but from a, I guess, fan, um, you know, engrossed in the, in the fan way of a New Zealand cricket supporter as well. It must be like this era of New Zealand cricket, finalists 2015 in the World Cup, finalists 2019, so close to getting over the line, now finalists in the World Test Championship final. I mean, it seems um, almost too cliche to be like, what will it mean to New Zealand cricket to win the World Test Championship final? But it's almost like the, 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 how close New Zealand cricket have been for the last six years now in major tournaments. This one, if you get over the line, I mean, it could be like the best moment in New Zealand cricket history, surely. Sure. Yeah, totally. I mean, it'll be so satisfying. Like yeah. you say, it's, you know, we've had so much success in series and, you know, winning percentages over the mm. few years, but like um, we haven't quite been able to jump that hurdle of winning a world tournament. And, and this one's so prestigious. I mean, going to the UK and playing at, you know, at a neutral venue against such a, a great Indian side, you know, yeah. the Indian side's actually gone to Australia and won the last two series they played against them in Test cricket. So they're at the peak of their powers as well. So, um, it'll be a great challenge, I think. Um, and like you say, if we do go over there and, and win, I think it'll go down New Zealand cricket history. And and we've got the personnel to do it. I mean, the, like we keep harping on, you know, every time we have an interview with somebody, not saying this is like an interview, but, mm. um, you know, we keep harping on about the depth in New Zealand cricket at the moment and, and how many guys come in straight into their spot and perform. I mean, last night, again, Devin Conway, mm. I mean, you know, hasn't played test cricket before. Um, you know, it's not like he was playing against a an average team and he's got two of the most prolific bowlers in the history of test cricket bowling at him first day at Lords, mm. probably his first game at Lords. pressure's high and he comes in and scores 130 not out. I mean, um, that's phenomenal. And he's, he's just another one of, of a lot of guys that just keep coming in and performing straight away. So um, that depth, I think is playing a huge part in, in why we're being, I guess, continuing to have the success that we have. Yeah. yeah. Ish, uh, j- j- Speaking about you, we got you on here. Like uh, from you know, you went from club cricket to international cricket in the space of a year. Uh, playing Test cricket at twenty years old, uh, you talked about playing your first one in front of thirty thousand people in Chittagong against Bangladesh, and you, you've made public comments saying you know at the time you had no belief in yourself. You told yourself you're not good enough, you're not fit enough. What are you doing here? You don't belong. All very good grade cricket sledges um, to yourself. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we all, we all know about the head. Doesn't want to be. Here. Um, <laughs> Can you just walk? Can you just walk us through that experience a little bit, and then how how your your mental game and your cricket journey has evolved and developed since then as well? Yeah, I suppose the jump is vast. I mean, the jump from club cricket alone to first class cricket is a really big jump, um, and then having played, I think, ten first class games before playing a test match um, in completely foreign conditions again. Mm. Um, you know, I was still living at home for, I guess, the two years I'd finished school. Um, I had a part-time job at a grocery store. So it was just a massive change in, in you know, such a short period of time, like you say. And um, I guess coming to terms with that and, and dealing with things like media and, and dealing with completely different personnel uh, on a daily basis, I, you know, that was obviously quite a bit of a challenge upon reflection. You know, at the time, you're like, um, you know, in there and you try to do as best as you can and stuff. Not Upon reflection, I think it would have been great to um, – have I guess a few more games of first class cricket just to understand my game and understand myself a little bit more so so that became a bit of a challenge but then you know you fast forward a little bit further on and you try to simplify it um, and then when you look at club cricket in itself I mean I, I had a great piece of advice once uh, when I, I was actually having a, a couple of beers with a good mate of mine he said mate what are you, what are you worried about like international cricket's just you know the world's best club he's coming together to play big game club cricket <laughs> <laughs> like it's, like, and, and, then, and then you actually peel it back and you're like, well, club cricket's the, you know, the starting point and you get you know, district cricket, first class cricket, international cricket. Like everyone comes from a club system. We're just all the best clubbies at the time. Mate, we're all clubbies at heart. We've all got that, kind of, you know, got that passion. So nowadays, I guess when I get a little bit overawed about it, I'm like, right, I'm just this clubby playing, playing cricket against you know, India's 11 best clubbies or... <laughs> So the best club is in life, so um, it often makes it feel a little bit easier. It's just, so you're saying international cricket's just club all stars, yeah. really? It's just like the That's NBA All Star Weekend, yeah. but for clubbies, yeah, absolutely. 
<laughs> I can see the headlines tomorrow. Sodi calls Coldy clubby. <laughs> he, but he is genuinely the best clubby that's ever walked this <laughs> Just speaking of in India and, and going back to the IPL ish, um, I've noticed, uh, you know, there's some. It's it's not a hazing ceremony so much as it is a, a, an introduction into into new teams when you're joining and you, I, I saw when you were playing for Rajasthan you had to do a rap in front of the entire team mm. and, and at the time Steve Smith was there at Rajasthan and he had some very bemused looks on his faces as he often does as is his want um, Steve bless his heart and soul um, but uh, <laughs> but can you can you talk about some of the uh, in- introduction ceremonies that you have when you join a new IPL franchise. Um, well, I've, you know, I've only been part of one IPL franchise, but mm. um, it's fair to say, I guess, the majority of the teams that I've been involved in, you know, you have quite a few uh, different initiation ceremonies, and I think that they've probably got a lot, e- a lot less damaging as the years have gone on. I mean, you know, you, you hear some stories, um, you know, of, of the '80s and '90s, and you know, that must have been a completely different era. Yeah. Sure, some of those stories. Are, Pretty pretty tough to, to hear, um, but I, I think things are pretty tame at the moment. You know, doing a rap in front of a team, I guess, is you know you get a little a few nerves here and there, but you can yeah. get over it and it's okay. Um, or sometimes you might have to go to a, a local Indian uh, restaurant and have the spiciest food yeah. um, there, and that's an initiation. So um, I think as we progress, um, it's getting <laughs> probably a little bit more tame. Yeah, yeah. We, we mentioned Coley. Earlier, Ish, uh, you were the number one T20 eyeballer in the world a couple of years back. Um, so I just want to take you to the T20 World Cup in 2016. New Zealand makes 126 against India. You take three for 18, including Coley. Uh, what do you remember from that game? Um, I remember that it was a Bunsen burner. Um, <laughs> and we actually batted first, and, and I think we were like 70 or 80 off 80 no's, and I was like, yikes, this, this game could be over pretty quickly. Um, but it, it actually was the last couple of overs. Luke Ronke got us up to a score of about 124. Uh, a fellow, you know, ex-Australian, mm. um, Australian cricketer, Luke Ronke, who was you know, great for New Zealand over that period. Mm. And anyway, we came out to um, bowl, and there were three spinners in the team. Myself, Mitchell Satner, and Nathan McCullum was, I guess, the leader of the pack. Um, and he bowled in the power play. A couple of balls turned, and he came to us and said, boys, um, there's a bit of fun to be ha- to have had out here, uh, to be had out here. So just make sure you back your skills and spin it as hard as you can. And so that was the first piece of advice I got out there in the middle. And, and it was my first game for New Zealand in the World Cup. So um, there were obviously quite a few nerves there. Massive crowd, first game of the World Cup. Um but the wicket was turning, so it gave me a bit of confidence that if I put the ball in a, in a somewhat a good area, I could cause some some sort of issues. And, and thankfully, the first one I bowled was in a decent area. You know, got the got the edge of Coley, um, which you know is, I guess, quite a big wicket um, when it yeah. comes to yeah. India chasing and chasing ODIs and T20s. He's been the best yeah. for a number of years. So it's nice to start off a campaign like that. It was a shame that we couldn't go on uh, any further than the semi final. Mm. Uh, you, you've played in the you played in the CPL, the IPL, the BBL. I think you played in the Vitality Blast as well. Can you can you rank those like the quality of those tournaments based on you know based on strength? And given that you've taken six for eleven, and which contracts you want? <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> given you took <laughs> given you took six for eleven in the BBL, I'm going to presume that that's the highest standard. Oh, absolutely! Um, <laughs> I think the world's toughest toughest clubbies are in the BBL. Absolutely, <laughs> the tough. Right, so tough. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but the wickets are better. The wickets are better, so it, like you know, a lot of you can just come out there and, and block bash. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> block bash. No, but definitely, like, like IPL, I think is up there. You know, you just have like a range of um, international superstars there. Um, Big yeah. bash, I, I find was a really, really high, um, highly ranked competition as well. It's just I was only there for about three or four games, so I didn't really get a chance to play a lot. Mm. Um, Vitality Blast. I remember I was a bowler in uh, Nottingham, and Nottingham. You know, it was, I guess, renowned for being a, a huge, a high-scoring ground with small boundaries. You know, wicket was like concrete, especially the first season that I was there. So I found that place a huge challenge, um, mm. especially as a bowler. So, you know, IPL would definitely stick up there, but I think I think all the other competitions are probably um, a similar standard. Um, and, and, yeah, I, I guess it depends on, depends on the availability of the international guys from the local countries and then also depends on um how many you know pros that you're allowed and, and if mm. their um, international schedules don't 
don't interfere. So, yeah. Our great friends at Manscaped are back. Hey, fellas, we are in the thick of winter and the storms are brewing. It looks like one to three inches are in the forecast when you trim that hibernation bush that's taking place in your pants. Luckily, our partners at Manscaped, TM, specialise in products to make sure you're walking around town with beautiful snowballs. Join over 2 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped, TM, with this exclusive offer for you, 20% off and free worldwide shipping with code TGC at manscaped.com. Now, here goes. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Because of the ceramic blade and advanced skin-safe technology of the Lawnmower 3.0 trimmer, your snags on your snowballs will be reduced. The trimmer is also waterproof, so you can trim the shower or jacu- in the shower or jacuzzi if you're a savage, Robbie Savage. Hang on a second. Is someone shaving their balls in a jacuzzi? Because that's a disgrace if someone's doing that. Hey, send in some photos of you shaving your balls. To- <laughs> no, doesn't it make you a savage? <laughs> Fred. Fred Savage. <laughs> Talk about the wonder years. Like a wonder cock. <laughs> <laughs> That's what Homer's wonder bat was all about. It's an allegory. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, uh, he goes, when was the last time you, you shaved your balls? Um, I can't think of the exact date. So usually I like to send you a text as it's happening, as you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, a little photo update. Um, I can't remember. Uh, it would have been a couple of weeks ago because obviously we're heading, we're obviously heading to a stage now where everything is closed here uh, in, in gorgeous Melbourne. Um, and so the, the necessity for it, uh, given the lack of opportunity to meet people, etc., uh, it makes it less, less of a requirement. So it's been a couple of weeks, I reckon, maybe, maybe three weeks. Yep. Yeah. Cool. That's all. You? Uh, I, I actually have the scaper in the shower. Yeah, same. I had, I actually had let it run for a little while recently, yeah, yeah, but yeah. then I, I, do you go I'm for to clean it up? Do you go for like a like just let it go and then just go for like a real long session, or just go for a little, little sort of touch up every couple of days, just like watering plants? No, <laughs> oh, let's get a water the plants. <laughs> Why are you in the shower again? <laughs> Dad, what's that noise? Quiet. Watering the plants. Who's that? Your neighbour. <laughs> uh. Yeah, in the past it was let it let it run before before the manscaped actually. Yeah, yeah let yeah. it run. And yeah, then, yeah, you know, same, same. Get to it in all sorts of poor ways, really, until the manscaped came along. But once I realised I was able to get it into the shower and actually trusted that it would work despite water being on it, which is a little abstract to start with. I think something's going to electrocute. I know it's yeah, not electricity, yeah, 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 yeah. but like just just the general fizzing and fuzzing and. Seeing the light go on and there's water there, you think, oh, no, my no, penis same, is about to be on fire. I had the same thought because um, how come if you're wet, how can you use like a hairdryer? Like how much water needs to be around you or on you for you to electrocute yourself if you're like hair drying? Yeah, I don't know the answer to that. Mm. The bundle also comes with a crop preserver, ball yep. deodorant and crop reviver, ball toner. Mm. The crop preserver is anti-chafing ball deodorant that will make your balls smell nice and make you feel like your testes are walking in a winter wonderland. That's for those in the Southern Hemisphere. (laughs) (laughs) The crop reviver is a spray-on toner for your balls. It's made with soothing aloe and and witch hazel extracts that will make your balls look up at you and say thanks. (laughs) What? I know when I spray on my crop reviver, my balls look up at me and say thanks. They look up at you and say yeah. thanks. Now, if you, what, if, What's the sound your balls make? What sort of voice has your balls got? Pezza. <laughs> that, that gruff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, pack a day job, yeah. Pezza, oi, hey. Hey, Pezza. <laughs> Cheers. His country. Yeah. Yeah, he's, he's very sort of slack-jawed, um, sort of the earth type. We'll help you out. But has a has an edge to him. Get twenty percent off plus free shipping with the code TGC at manscaped.com. There's other products that you can get as well. Twenty percent off with free shipping at manscaped.com. Use the code TGC. Thanks, Manscaped, for making our winter wieners look so good. <laughs> Hashtag us TGC. Thank you to Anrik Nokia and Ish Sodi.
wonderful to have some international uh, international flavour on the show over the last couple of weeks. Obviously, Mornay. Was that last week? Yeah, that was last yeah. week. Mornay last week. Mornay loved it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great feedback on the Mornay interview, actually. Yeah, that's good. really good. That's good. That's good. He was good. Hey, for those who are listening, you've made it this far on the cast, it's Higo's birthday tomorrow. Oh, that's very kind. On um, Tuesday, the 8th of June. <laughs> okay, depending on when you're listening. It's very listening. specific. Uh, thank you for doing that for me. Um, all right, hashtag RCDC. Tim Lindsay writes in. Uh, he says, can you coach please wade into the off-stump guard debate? The Poms are taking off-stump guards and accordingly a goal-kicking straight half volleys. Personally, I think it's yuck and rare, always has been, but I want your strongly worded and or legal opinion on the off-stump guard. Also, cheers for the absolute acid trip of a music montage in the last free potty. Anon. That's obviously coming through Patreon. So for those who are catching up, like like NASA Hussain, Mark Butcher and Mark Atherton did a big thing on Sky a few weeks ago talking about the like increased incidences, incidents of uh, people getting LBW right. uh, beaten on the inside from balls nipping in because a lot of guys are taking off stump guards now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? And they were sort of – they were saying it was pretty ridiculous uh, and that like – The taking off the guard is taking – the, Taking of off stump, that they're really open to being LBW – and um, and then it's created a bit of a debate, mate, because like a couple of the I know a couple of the England batters, uh, like um, Butler and Stokes and stuff, have actually come back on Twitter and, oh, right. sa- and said uh, you need to look at how you know the way decisions are going in twenty twenty one, etc. or whatever. But the basic idea of it is like as yeah, as we said, most people sort of take centre, mm. um, but these guys are getting uh, are taking off guard, so they're right in front of the stumps, and there's a lot of LBWs. I mean, look at Kane Williamson against um, Ollie Robinson in the in the third yeah, innings. Yeah. It was yeah. that kind of gear. Yeah. Um, so I reckon the reason people are doing this is because of what Smith did in the Ashes. This is basically how Steve Smith bats. He bats with his head on off stump or a little bit outside, and what happens is bowlers just go, uh, I'll just hit the stumps, and he just smashes you through mid-wicket, and yeah. he gets heaps of runs. And yeah. You look at all of his wagon wheels, there's barely anything outside off stump. You mm. just keep going, well, he's got to miss one, and he doesn't miss it, mm. right? Yeah. Mm. Um, that's part of uh, like when we spoke to Trent Woodhill like a couple of years ago, who was at the time Steve, Steve Smith's batting coach. He was just saying it was just about trying to replicate a uh, 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 create a technique which he could replicate over and over again. And for that, for that, your bowling's legs, he can just hit that a hundred times out of a hundred. Exactly. And so, yeah, batting off stump, bowl to the pads, runs. Yeah, that exactly right. It, it, it's an attacking position, but mm. batting on off stump has a dual purpose. So one is to like to serve as a guide for the head and the eyes for a lot of guys. So like if you're on off stump, you know that anything outside your eye line you can leave. It's where your eye so you know, people go, oh you yep. know you want to know where your off stump is. Yeah. Right. But if you just put your eyes over the top of it, yep. if it's outside your eye line, you yep. leave. You know you're fine. Right. Um and then the second purpose is if you bat with your head on off stump, like the bowler challenges you on the stumps and you can whip him through the onside. Uh, as long as you're getting a straight enough bat to it. But like it's I don't think it's an overly new thing. Like there's been exponents of in the past. Like it's what Simon Kadish did. Mm-hmm. It's what Shandipal did. They crabbed the cross, but they were sort of regarded as like um, cavaliers mm. uh, and a little bit strange for doing it. But now it's become more mainstream. Um, everything has a risk reward. Like if you want to score your runs, if you want to score your runs there, you have to play around your body a little bit. And if guys can't play with a straight bat through there, then they mm. end up risking getting hit on the pads. Because the, this, this is like, oh, we've now fixed, the, we've now got the perfect technique, but there's so many ways to get out in exactly. the laws of cricket. That like, especially if, if, you, if you're batting an off stump and a ball starts coming into middle and leg, your natural inclination is to start falling over. Now, yeah. like, now you have a misalignment between the ball, the stumps, and the wickets behind you. So there's just problems each way. For so, every action, there's, there's a reaction. Like right. it's the same thing. It's a, it's a compensation thing that's specific to the batter themselves. The batter will know whether they need more help around off stump, so they put their eyes over there and, they, and they're quite good on their legs, so they, that's where they present the risk to themselves. And other batters go the other way. You know, it's about working out what's best for you. But I'm sure there must be data to suggest has to be. that there are fewer LBWs being given or something, so people are just covering their stumps a bit more. I don't know if it's a DRS thing. Or I don't know if like p- bats are much better now, so that if you can play straight around your pads, mm. you're getting more value for mm. it. I don't know if they're wider mm. or something like that, but there must be a reason for it. I don't mm. think it's as simple as like batters just getting it wrong. There's literally going to be like, there's like 17 people in every international team now, analytic guys, data mm. guys, and also data guys. Mm. Um, yeah, just of course. Imp- implementation just from the BCCI. Sympathizers for yep. Saurav Ganguly. <laughs> In every single team, and they're going to be like, "Well, here's some analytics. Here's like mm. all your all your scoring zones, etc." He'll be seeing all this data, and then if you're a commentator on Sky, for instance, who would know the game so well, but you're not seeing this, you'd be like, "Well, that's weird. Mm. Why are you doing that? When you just play down the ground, just play straight." This is it's actually not that dissimilar 
Uh, it's almost like an evolution of like the reverse sweet debate. Whereas like guys who are like in a literal the generation before, e.g. Warren, talking to Kawaja being like, why are you guys reverse sweeping or Mark War or mm. whatever? Because they never played it. Mm. And when they did it, it was a risk. But now now fucking people playing in test matches when they're on less than 10. Mm. So it's just an evolution of the game, I suppose. But yeah, like as you said, for every every action is a reaction. So I don't think this is going to be like, oh, now batsmen are going to be harder to get out. There should yeah. be out different ways. I don't think averages are particularly better or anything like that. I, I also wonder, like, from a social perspective, which is probably where Tim wants to get at, like, it's kind of like the granny shot in basketball. Like, yeah, um, yeah. Batting like, off is odd. Well, yeah. Like, so no one wants to do the granny shot where you shoot from underarm, even though the um, the stats on shooting underarm for a free throw yeah. is better than overhand because yeah. it just it was beta. It mm. was cuck stuff. Mm. I wonder if, like, maybe guys want to bat. Do you remember, like, playing backyard cricket and – it would be really annoying because guys would stand in front of their stumps. And because you don't like, because it's street yeah, justice, you right. don't really play LBWs. Yeah, yeah. So they take it out of play. Mm. I just wonder if guys are batting in front of their stumps now because it's like, if I'm going to get out, mm. I'd rather the ball hit my pad so it hasn't gone past me. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? I still stopped the, it. I still stopped it and yeah. the ball remains in front of me. Yeah, yeah. Whereas, like, if you nick, if you nick the ball or you're bowled, the ball has actually beaten you and gone past you. Isn't and the guys behind get to do dangerous it. game because once it hits you, then it's like then it's basically down to ball tracking. Yes, and down to technology, and it's like well, umpires call, so it's yeah. still down to like what the umpire says, and then you like the hands of the gods. Yeah, but you still got the way, you still got in the way of the ball. Yeah, so got in the way. That's why yeah. people are doing it. I think it's just a big alpha play. So I I was obviously a fine player yes. uh, at international level, especially. I I used to take leg uh, as my guard. Those basically goal cross. Uh, no. Mm. So basically I was just trying to get my legs out of the way because I used to kick fucking everything in front of the stumps. Anything on the stump, I'll kick that. Wherever you want, I'll kick it. I was just trying to get my <laughs> yeah. legs out of the way. Oh, right. I yeah, just exactly. wanted to play cover drives. I wanted yeah. to be Ian Bell. That's what I wanted. And Damien Martin. I thought you were going to say like you batted on legs so you could back away here. <laughs> <laughs> in the square leg umpire's pocket. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. I, used to, I think I used to get across a little bit as well. And then what happens is because it was like – because when you open the batting, it's all about trying to cover off stump. Right, and so you're like, right. it's all about precision around off stump. And then occasionally guys will get you LBW. You're like, oh, all right, well, I've missed a, I've missed a leg side scoring opportunity. You know, you're like, yeah. r- rather than like everything when you're opening the batting is about that fucking contest beto- of off bail. Who can, can you mm. defend the off bail better than they, they, better than they can attack it? Yeah, 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 exactly. So, and then you end up getting dragged so far across that mm. someone will just pin you LB, which is how Ollie mm. Robinson got Kane Richardson. Yeah. He, he called it Williamson. for the game. Williamson, mm. Kane Richardson. No, 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 I'm talking about Kane Richardson. He's <laughs> <laughs> Kiwi now. He's <laughs> batting fourth for New Zealand. Kane Williamson. Yeah. Um, he said, oh, if you, I'm going to pull him across and nip one back. And he did, did exactly that. Yeah, so that's pretty good skill. Um, let's drop him. Uh, yeah. Okay, Anon, he goes right in. Yeah. Um, and he says, please keep it on. Hashtag AskTJC. Boys, would New Zealand be the most aesthetically pleasing team to tub with? Kane, Southie, Jamison, DeGrondo. What's your fantasy? What's your tubbing fantasy 11? I don't, Anon. Okay. Colin is in there because yeah. I want to see it wet. I want to see the salad wet. All oh, right. I want to see his penis wet. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah and I wa- the hair, it'd be hairy. Yeah, I suppose so. How would the chest on it must be oh, something yeah. else? Incredible. You'd be like, oh, there's dad. New Zealand up, up there, probably the best looking team. Mitchell Santner, good looking, good looking boy. Good looking boy. Yeah. Tim South. I saw it described as a bit of a school librarian, good looking. Yeah. Okay. Santner. He's got his glasses on. Mm-hmm. But what he'd do? Yeah. <laughs> read some books. I suppose so, yeah. England, England had a, a real a real golden era there, especially with Sir Arthur Cook, and I will use his full title. Oh, you find him a, an attractive man? Arthur Cook's a good looking guy, yeah, mm-hmm. for sure, for mm-hmm. sure. You saying he's not? No, I'm not saying he's not. I'm not saying like he's. I wouldn't. I wouldn't sort of call him out and say, "Hey, he's hot." Now Australia's going through a real lean patch, I reckon. Yeah. At the moment, in terms of real like roosters getting in, getting bums in seats through aesthetics, yeah. there's obviously stoyness goes without saying. Yes. Uh, Apart from that, not much else. Is that top of my head? I'm just trying to think. Top of my head, what else is going on? People would say pain, clean. Yep, sure. Pat Cummins, of course. Yeah, Pat Cummins. Cummins, Cummins, No doubt. No doubt. I don't know if there's ever been. I suppose we're quite gruff as Australian men, aren't we? Mm. Whereas New Zealand men are very good looking, Mm. in my opinion. Fantasy tubbing eleven. I mean, you you will have written that down a few times in your notes. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know if I have an eleven. Yeah. Um. I guess the first but, question is past but, or present. But I'm. But you know, you got to have a. Yeah. Okay. You got to have a balance of aesthetics. Yeah. For some reason, not sure why. Homoerotica, I guess. And also, I just want stories, and a bit of horseplay. Yeah. That's it's, what you want in your dream yeah. tubbing eleven. 
like karaoke, like spirit is willing, flesh is weak yeah. stuff. I want no, it someone doesn't to have to, to be eleven wonderful pieces of flesh. Like I don't, I don't want like. I mean, I didn't, didn't even want to ever play with any like super pigs, like just. <laughs> I don't want to go in there and someone just is – it's absolute piggery. I, I don't want to want that. A of no, of course. That's what I mean. I never enjoyed showering with those people. Yeah, yeah. So you just kind of want someone that's in there who's got a bit about them. They're yeah. going to bring some outdoor, uh, some outdoor furniture into the shower. They've got yeah. a cold beer. Uh, and so they know how to there. manage themselves in a tub. Not necessarily a wonderful rig, tub salad, management, penis. Tub management. Yeah, it's about how you carry yourself in the tub 100%, as well. Yep. Y- you need guys in there for a fantasy tubbing eleven mm-hmm. that you can compete with as well, so mm. to speak. Like you don't just want eleven Adonises where you just feel like it fucking. Don't say that. What's in my head? But yeah, someone's got to be in there with a comically large penis. Of course, comically large. Yeah. <laughs> and how do they carry? They that? have to be in there. Yeah. Yeah. Do they know it? Yeah, of course I do. But they but don't not need not to. not to the point where it's they are it's their identity. Yeah, but it has to be in there. Yes, of course. Yeah, that's that's a definite. Mm. And then just some storytellers. Then you see friends. It's actually yeah. no different. I just want to shower with my friends. What's wrong with that? Yeah, exactly. What's wrong with wanting me? Me wanting to shower with my friends? Yep. Someone's gonna clip that up. <laughs> <laughs> I think you answered that really well. <laughs> What a way to finish a show and an otherwise quite analytical and serious show, but you can always mm. get some penis stories in there, as is our want and need. Uh, thank you very much to Anrik Norkier, to Ish Sodi. Thank you very much for supporting us uh, during this strange time where the next thing matters. And you know what? This podcast doesn't matter, guys. It's actually the next one that matters. So we'll see you next week.